From Philadelphia, the city that pulsates with the beat and the rhythms of yesterday and today, it's time for the Geeter with the Heater, the boss with the hot sauce, Jerry Blavitt. 60 seconds make one minute, 60 minutes make one hour, 24 hours make one day, and out of that 24 hours, two and a half hours are dedicated by the young teenager to the hip fish show on the radio. So without further ado, let's carry on through now. Five, four, three. Two, one, blast off! Yon teenager gather round. Ha ha! Do the sound I'm a putting back. Ladies and gentlemen, there are certain legends in this industry that from the very beginning, when they found where that they want to go and the God-given talent that they had, that through all of the obstacles that happen in show business, the ups and downs, the one name that remains the same through all of the years is a friend of mine that I have known since before he was with the Four Seasons. You know him as Frankie Valley. Frankie Valley is a performer that is ageless because of the fact of the music. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my ageless friend, Al Pacino. <laughs> Frankie. What's going on, man? <laughs> I love that look. <laughs> look. Talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> Frank, first of all, let me tell you, I miss you. I mean, because if this pandemic were not around, you and I would eat and rabbi always drinking wine. You will be with Jackie and I will be with Keely. But here we are through this new modern thing called modern technology. And whether you realize it or not, Frank, you have thousands and thousands of people who are watching us now. Now, I know the entire history, but for the young people, and ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about Frankie Valley. He's one of the performers today that spans all ages. If you go to the concerts, you have kids six years old up until 65, 70, 80, 90. You've been able to do that from the very beginning. Now, for the audience out there, let's talk about the four lovers. Let's talk about the Romans. And let's talk about how you hooked up with Gorio, Nick Massey, and Tommy DeVita to form the Four Seasons. Well, which one do you want first? Well, <laughs> I want you to tell the people how it happened. You come from one group. We know that Gordio was singing with the Royal Teens uh, and, you know, short shorts and all of that other stuff. But how, how was the hookup? Well, it, it starts out with the variety trio to the variety tones mm -hmm. to Billy Dixon and the topics to Frankie Tyler <laughs> to... Uh, I mean, and, and group names, were there were many. Uh, the Romans, uh, we could start out with that. Uh, but the Four Lovers were, uh, uh, were the first taste of any kind of success at all. Mm -hmm. And that all happened through the fact that when I was very young in my teens, uh, I, I was hooked up with, with a, a manager in New York that was also in the publishing business. Mm -hmm. His name was Dave Cap. Oh, Cap Records. Cap oh, Records. Dave. Cap, his name was Paul Cap. His brother was Cap. Uh -huh. Dave. Uh huh. They, these guys were the original people that brought Decca Records to America mm. from from uh, the UK. Right. Uh. So. The way I really got started, I was working around just going into these clubs that Tommy DeVito and 
Nick Massey and Tommy's brother, Nick DeVito, were working and they called me up to sing. And what happened was Nick, uh, Nick DeVito and Nick Massey ended up being arrested and going to jail. <laughs> so there was Tommy DeVito and I was just kind of hanging out at that time. So we were hanging out and he was working in a, in a place in Newark that was a country club. Mm -hmm. I, I forget the name of the place. But he was working with a girl named Jean Valley. And he says, come down to this place. He says, and, uh, and I'm doing this, this country date and, and I'm going up to sing. Mm -hmm. So I, I went down and he told her to call me up to sing. I sang and after I got off and the set was over, she came in and said, you have a very unique voice. And I'd like to uh, take you to meet some people in New York. And that, mm -hmm. that, those people were Paul Cap of right. General Publishing Music. Uh, I sang for this guy. He liked the way I sang. She told this publisher that I was her brother. That's where the Valley came in. Her name was Jean Valley. And it, when it came time to sign the contract, he says, okay, he said, you have to bring your parents in because I wasn't old enough. Right. So I, I, I brought my parents in and they said, he said, your name is not Valley. I thought you, this was your sister. You know, he said, well, we, uh, what is your name? It's Castelluccio. He said, well, we can't use a name like that. <laughs> Uh, and, and he signed me to a, a, a record contract and a management contract and reco he recorded me doing uh, an old Georgie Jessel song called My Mother's Eyes which I and love kind of a regional success with that and then it was just pounding the pavement and going every week into New York all week long uh banging on doors, making contacts, meeting writers, meeting performers, meeting publishers, trying to get a deal. Right. And I became very friendly with Otis Blackwell, who wrote all the Elvis Presley hits. Yep. And I started doing demos for Otis and, and Charlie Singleton and Jesse Jackson, who were some of the great... Uh, uh, Jesse Stone, I'm sorry. The writer. Jesse Stone, the writer. Yeah. Right. So then I, 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 I got a, a deal with Bob Crew to do two sides uh, for uh, Epic Records at the time, that was. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing came out of that. Mm -hmm. And back to every day to New York. Every day, and, I, and my father had a brother who worked in, in the post office in, in Newark, New Jersey. And on his day off during the week, he had a day off during the week, he would come with me to New York and make the rounds with me and buy me lunch and give me enough money to go back and forth to New York all week long. So then I did a record with Hugo and Luigi. Was that on RCA, Victor? Hugo and Luigi was, yeah, it was RCA yeah. Victor. Uh -huh. It was when they had that deal at RCA right. Victor when they took over. Right. From, uh, I forget the guy, the harmonica player that used to be the head of, uh, right. uh, of that label. Uh, they did, uh, Dusty Draper was one of the groups they did. They did the Gaylords. Uh, they, they they did a whole bunch of, uh, right. of people that were well-known mm -hmm. people. Before that, they did children's music, mm -hmm. but they became big in, in, in that. And nothing happened with that. And so I'm just bouncing around. And Otis Blackwell 
through him hearing me and, and so forth and so on and becoming friends with me, hooks me up with a publisher called Goldie Goldmark, who was hey, his... Goldie Goldmark, right. Yes, yes. And let's see, then uh, we get a deal at RCA Victor, we do an album called Joyride. We, out of that, we get a single that is a regional, it's making noise regionally, mm -hmm. called You're the Apple of My Eye. I remember that. <laughs> uh, we do the Ed Sullivan Show three times. Uh, we work with Sophie Tucker. We work uh, with Don Rickles. We work with... We did a convention with, with Nat King Cole. I mean, you know... Right, we, but this is like 1959. It's about that time. Yeah, yeah. Maybe even a little earlier than that. Uh-huh. Would be. So, then we were on the, on the road promoting a record that, that we had done. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's how I first met Bob Gordia. It was, I think it was Baltimore, I'm not sure. We were doing one of those daytime television shows for kids. Mm -hmm. And the Royal Teens were on. And and Bob and I met for the very first time. I wasn't that impressed with short shorts, so. <laughs> it, 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 Who wears short shorts? <laughs> so... Then later on, I met Bob. Uh, Bob Crew? Yeah, no, Bob Gordio again. Oh, okay. Through Joe Pesci, who was, they were doing some stuff, some jazz. And Mike Petrillo, who wrote Tell Us to the Rain <clears throat> and became chief of police of Belleville, New Jersey. So when I met Bob the second time, he played me some songs that they had not recorded, and I was really impressed. And, and after beating my head against the wall for so long, mm -hmm. I realized that it didn't matter how well you sang or how great you were, without the material, there was... I said, this guy is what I need, I said. It's like an actor it, without a script. Exactly. You know. And you're as good as the, the material you have to work with. And I like the way he wrote. So we, I, I kind of twisted Tommy DeVito's arm a bit to hire Bob mm -hmm. in our group and the Four Lovers. Because that's what we were at that time. We changed the name to the Four Lovers. And we went about making demos and so forth and so on for quite a little while. And Bob and I were, were had made some appointments in New York to see various record companies uh -huh. and publishers to try to get a deal. Right. And so what happened is we went up to uh, uh, Larry Utah's Office. Abbott Stock Records, yeah, at that time, yeah. yeah before, Bell, uh, Bell Amy. Before that. Wow. I mean, he was, before all of that, mm -hmm. I can't think of the name, right, but it, it make up to me. Uh, we went up to Larry Utah. Uh, we played some stuff for him. Mm -hmm. And we were coming out, and he was going in. No, no, that it went the other way around. We had been there first, and we played the records, and he he was, it didn't seem as though he was that interested. Mm -hmm. So I had already recorded with Bob before, so I, I knew Bob. Right. And coming out, he was coming in for some stuff to play. And he said, hey, he says, well, Frankie, what are you doing here? And I, I said, we just brought some demos in for... Uh, for Larry, Larry. Uh, 
Madison Records. That's right. All of you. Okay. All right. All of you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Bob Cruz said, well, don't do anything with anybody. He says, here's my card. Give me a call. Come and see me tomorrow. Okay. And we went. We, you know, right. we left. We had the card. We had no idea what was going to happen. Frankie, let me tell you something. Let, you know, it's fun. Let me explain to the audience about Bob Crew. Bob Crew began with a fellow by the name of Frank Slay. And they had a song called Silhouettes by the Rays, which they wrote, Billy and Lily, if you remember, the Swan Records. And then Frank won his way and Crew won his way. So now Bob Crew was on his own when he met you and said, right. don't do anything. And right. that's when it all began. Right. He, he had a big penthouse apartment, five flights up, no elevator. <laughs> and we went up to uh, his apartment. We played him the songs. He liked them. He, uh, he said, I want to sign you guys and, and so forth and so on. And I'm, I'm not sure. I think he came out to see us play someplace. And he was very impressed. So we, we had a deal with Bob Crew, but what was happening in that period of time that we were with Crew, he wasn't recording us, he was recording all these other people. And we were playing all the instruments for these people and doing all the backgrounds yes. for everybody, every, including the Rays, which was one of the, the groups he had. And we went to him and says, you know, we've been together now three years. What's what's going on? Are you, are you going to record us or not? Okay. If you're not going to record us, you're going to let us out and we'll... Look again for another label. Right. Uh, he put a session together with very limited amount of money that he had. We did five songs at that session. Originally, we started out with doing four songs. Mm -hmm. And on the way to rehearsal, we were rehearsing these songs uh, at Bob's house and Nick's house and Tom's house and my house. That That's how we would get together. And he said, okay, he says, we're going to do this. We'll do it on a Sunday. Uh... Uh, if, if you went in there on a Sunday or a Saturday, you got all the rental stuff that was there from the sessions before. Yes. So you didn't have to rent anything. So on the way to rehearsal, Bob comes up with this idea and he writes the song and he jots it down and, and the song is Sherry. And he comes to rehearsal, we rehearse the song with a little resistance from Tommy, who wasn't that sure. He never wanted a piano player in the band. I mean, that was one of the things. Uh, we play it over the phone and sing it over the phone to crew. He loves it. He says, we'll put that on the, on the date too. Uh, we recorded it. It sounded terrific. I mean, we and we were self-contained except for a drummer that we brought in. With, and uh, I think Tommy played guitar, Nick played bass. Uh, he, Nick also played rhythm guitar, and a drummer, and I think another guitar player is what we had. So it's a very small date. So for. Three grand is what it cost. We got five songs finished, done. Yeah, happened today, folks. Right. That, then it came time to start bringing it around. And there was a music convention. And right. you know all about that part of it, right? <laughs> 1962. Bob Crew has a demo, and it was a demo, an acetate. And he's. Well, it wasn't really a demo. It w it was an acetate. You're absolutely right about acetate. that. And those days, 
when, when you got a sample of what you recorded, it, it went on, on this metal thing yeah. that was covered with plastic that cut the grooves in the record. You, you know, so he says to me at the bar, I was with Nat Sigler, he says, I want you to hear something. And back then they had the little Phillips, little record player where you could put it on. All the record guys had this little cockamamie thing. And he plays Sherry. I said, crew, it's a smash. He said, I got to see Morris Levy, who you know, with Roulette Records. He says, Morris is interested maybe in purchasing this song. I said, you tell Morris, it's a smash. Okay. Four hours later, at eight o'clock at night, I'm coming back downtown into the Fontainebleau at the bar, his crew. He's drinking. And you know, he drank pretty good sometimes. One of those days, yeah. <laughs> I said, man, my man, congratulations. You made a deal. He said, deal my ass. He said, Morris told me it's the worst piece of shit he ever heard. And he told me to tell you that you lost your ear. I said to the bartender at the bar, give me the house phone. I called our buddy, Abner Hewitt. Now, I was sent down to Florida. Hewitt, I think, Abner. Right, Abner Hewitt, BJ Records. You were Abner. Yeah. Who wind up with Motown. Okay. I say, Ab, I want to come up with Bob Crew. He knew who Bob was. We go up. He plays the acetate. He says to me, Dieter, you're right. This is a smash. He says to the crew, tell me about the group. Bob says it's Frankie Valley, formerly with the Lovers, Gordio, Short Shorts, Nick Massey. But Abner says, Peter, I love the song. It's a white group. We're a black label. We don't have any white artists. We got Jerry Button. We got the Spaniels. We got the Dells. I said, Ab, what does music have to do with color or race? It's Everybody loves music, regardless of race, color, or religion. He says, well, I ain't going to get the black cats to play it. And Crew really was like, uh-uh, what am I going to do? I said, Ab, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say what I'm going to do. I'm going back to Philadelphia. I took that acetate, and I played it on WCAM in Camden. Now, this is the funny story about that. I played it two or three times at night. Now, back then, in the record business, if the record stores were getting calls, the record distributor or the one stops were looking to find out who had the record. They're getting calls for this song called Sherry. Mainline record distributors calls me and says, what is this song that you're playing by the Four Seasons Sherry? Where can we get it? Mainline was VJ's distributor. I said, Barry Golder. That's Frankie Valley. That's your record. I told Ab to pick it up. He says, I'm calling you back. Ab will call back. He says, oh, crew, we're going to make a deal. You were the first white group ever to appear on a black label. And I got to tell you, the early songs that you did, other than Sherry and Big Girls, Peanuts, Long, Long, Lonely Nights, since I don't have you alone, which the Shepherd Sisters did, that created the sound of the Four Seasons. Where did that sound come from, that falsetto sound? I mean, when I heard that, Frank, I mean, I knew the group had the, 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 the high lows type of harmony, the preps type of harmony, but your sound, that was the outstanding thing that I heard, falsetto. Did you always have that, Frank? Well, falsetto was nothing new. I mean, it, it, for years, all the R&B groups were doing falsetto, but as background, what we did is we reversed it. When when we recorded, I in many cases, I did two parts. I did a regular part, and I did a, a falsetto. Part. Right. And... What we did was put the melody on top, falsetto, and not a timid for falsetto. It was an aggressive one. Yes. And that's what created the sound. Now I, uh, I, I, 
I didn't know that that I had anything special going on. Uh, I, I thought it was just something that all singers have and 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 do it was just something natural that happened for me but like i said uh i'm not going to take credit for for Seto that has been around forever yeah, right i agree but back then there was nolan strong with the diablos it was clive mcfatter back then cats like little joe and the thrillers and you did penis and the bee right. thing that when i heard that i knew that you were a white cat I said, this is something. And you know, I look at you now with the goatee, you look like you never get old. Little people never get old, okay? And <laughs> when I see you on stage- They just have to be careful that they don't get too round. <laughs> Jackie will make sure that you don't get too round. Keely will make sure that I don't get too round. But young people today, ladies and gentlemen, that go to see Frankie Batty, it's like when I first played his song in 62, they hear it for the first time and it's brand new to them if they've not heard it on radio. And when they see him on stage, Frankie, your stage presence, I mean, where you had to learn that from the old timers, man, watching Sinatra and some of these, because you are from that throwback, Frank. Well, I was never big on, on, on dancing and, and choreography or any of that. Mm -hmm. I was just me, I mean, as, as, and concentrating on what I was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the early records that we did didn't give me the ability to show what I could do or if there was anything else that I could do. That came later it, on in your career. Well, it, it, it featured the top range of my voice in most cases. Uh, uh, and, and the song, we were trying to establish a sound that when the people turned the radio on, the public knew unique. exactly who they were hearing. Unique. Yeah. You know, I, you know it's interesting because Bob Crew and Gordio wrote the early hits. Then Kenny Nolan, Danny Rendell, they wrote some of the hits later on. And the early arrangements were with oh, Charlie Colello, right back then? Yes. CJ? Well, right. Charlie Colello was working in another band mm -hmm. when we were having this success. And even before we were having this success, we were still the Four Lovers. Mm -hmm. uh, that I used to go to see all the time. The, the group was called the Victorians. Mm -hmm. It had Charlie Colello and Artie Shrek were both in that group. And Charlie played an accordion at that time. And if there was ever an instrument that I was turned off on, it was accordion, except <laughs> when I heard him play it, it didn't sound like a, an accordion anymore. He played it amplified, and he played it like an organ. I mean, you know, and I was a major Jimmy Smith fan. Yeah. Uh, and a Jack McDuff, and a Scur Shirley Scott, uh, and, and a Joey DeFrancesco. It, that's what I was listening to, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, I liked... A lot of they they did a lot of modern stuff, more like the Four Freshmen, which was my favorite group of all the groups there ever were. They were the most organic. There were four guys that were really musicians and not really singers, but what they did to a song was so unique. There's never been anybody that's been able to copy what the four freshmen did. Now there were groups that technically were supposed to be better, like the Hilos and the Signatures. Yeah. Uh, and, and there was a black group at the time, also the Delta Rhythm Boys, that were also into, into singing modern stuff. Mm -hmm. So I convinced the guys to come and listen to Charlie Colello and he's the guy that's doing all these charts and all that. Yeah. And he's a great arranger. 
and Bob agreed with me. And we started using Charlie Colella, uh doing all of our arrangements. All the early stuff, stuff on VJ. Yeah. And even I think even when you went to Folks, because it was VJ, and then you went from VJ to Folks, right? With Dawn. Right. Right. Dawn. You know, talking about... Well, we almost went to Atlantic. What happened was... Uh, we recorded Dawn at Atlantic Records at their studio. Larry, uh, Jerry Wexler, Ahmed Erdogan. And Jerry and Ahmed both wanted, they wanted Dawn, you know, we hadn't made a deal yet. Uh, and Bob was talking to him, Bob Crew was talking to him, uh, since he was the producer. And and a, and a money situation, the, the, an advance that we were looking for. Yeah. They didn't want to do it, so we went to Phillips. Uh, Which, you know, basically was a new label. You really put that label on the map. Was, was a major company in Europe, and Phillips yeah. Electronics made all the telephone equipment. Yeah. And they were really polygram. You know, Phillips was... Yeah a part of what Polygram was, uh, an offspring of Polygram. Mm. Those songs, there's one song which I spoke, and we're gonna get into the Sinatra, how we were friends and all that. I Got You Under My Skin. That song, when you guys did that, was completely different with the harmonies, the arrangement, and your voice. That was the one song in my mind when I started to play that the phones rang off the law because it was so unique, the arrangement on that. Whose decision was to do a song that was a Sinatra signature song, Cole Porter, and you guys did it completely different. And the ending, bop, 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 and whoop, and then you hit that note at the end, back down, and then hit it a note again. That was stellar, my man. Well, the, <clears throat> the genius for all that was Bob Gordio. It was his idea. We had been working at the Fontainebleau Hotel, and Sinatra was, uh, was in Florida, too, at the same time. He was doing the movie, the Tony Rome movie. Right. And, and no, we went to see him. He was, he was at the Rock. He was performing. Yeah. We were either, what's the other, the Fonson Blue and the Diplomat, and there's another and one. Eden Rock. The Eden Rock. We were at the Eden Rock. He was he, at the Fonson Blue. We were invited over to see his show. We had a night off. We went over to see his show. And he did that song, well, the, as one of the many songs. Uh, I was in awe, just the fact that we were invited over to a Sinatra show. And after the show was over and so forth and so on, Frank was flying out someplace else, I think it was his last night. Uh, we went back to our hotel. And I was sleeping at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Gordio calls me and says, I got a great idea, man. I said, what's that? He said, we're going to record. I've got you under my skin. He says, I hear a whole record. Yeah. I said, we're going to record. I've got you under my skin. I said, Sinatra, we just saw him do that. <laughs> never going to beat that record. There's no way. He said, we're going to do it. And Charlie Colella was not available at the time. Uh -huh. The guy we used was Artie Shrek to do that arrangement. And Gordio worked with Artie on that arrangement. And that's... Let me tell you, that song changed the way the public looked at Frankie Valley. And the Four Seasons. And I, I will never forget, and I got to tell our audience a great story. Frank was appearing 
in Philadelphia. And Jilly called me and said, the old man, because my mom used to send spaghetti and macaroni and roasted peppers. Jilly said, the old man wants you to come over see the show. I said, I'm in New York City. I'm going to meet Frankie later on for a drink at your joint Jilly's. We're going to have a little drink. I haven't seen Frank. We're going to have some fun. You and I were at the bar. When we were at the bar, if you remember, Fabian was also with us, okay? What happened, it was empty. 1230, 1 o'clock in the morning, it was Frank comes in with Alan King and Julie and an entourage of 30 people as he carried. He sees you at the bar. He sees me at the bar. He hugs you. He says, come on over to the table. We go over to the table. Fabian is at the bar. Do you remember the story? Yeah. <laughs> Fabian's at the bar. We're sitting and everybody's having fun. Fabian sends a note over with the waiter because Frank used to sit in the back where the Chinese restaurant. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. The last so, booth. Right. So the note says, yo, Peter and Frankie, what about me? So I said to Jilly, Jill, I'm going to go get Fabian. Bring him over to say hello to Frank. Everybody's laughing. Tony says, go ahead. I bring Fabian over. Sinatra says, he looks at Fabian. I don't want to meet this guy. I turned white. And I said, Frank, I'll talk to you later on. And I left. I called you the next day. I said, what, what happened? And you said, I don't know. But his whole mood changed for the entire night. And that's one of the incidents in my mind. <laughs> yeah. And I will never forget about Frank, you, me. And but when, he, when uh, you know, the funny thing, everybody thought that he went on stage and was drinking on stage. He never really drank on stage. He didn't smoke before he went on stage. He did all of that after the show. <laughs> when he was drinking, he got to a certain point and then you had to either leave or say, geez, I'm getting tired, you know, and, and that's what it was. Listen, you hooked up. I remember when Sinatra came to see you when you guys worked the Waldorf Astoria. This is early on. I guess this has got to be maybe 64, Frank. Yeah. You remember no, that? Uh, this was... Uh, he he had already begun to work with Gordio on, on the Watertown, putting all that music together for him for the Watertown album, and we were working at the Waldorf, and he came by to see us, mm -hmm. and I did one of the songs for that he did in that album, uh, the Michael and Peter song. Wow! Yeah, you know. That album, which Gordio produced with Jake Holmes, Jake Holmes was out of Philadelphia very often. Right. That was one of the most underrated albums. Uh, Elizabeth, Michael is you, Peter is me. If I knew then what I know now, that album, I, I just don't know why that album never there was made it. highlight songs in that album. Elizabeth was one of them for me. There's that... that there's that string line mm -hmm. that uh, I, I have to break you. Okay. You right. Oh, that's you. Hello. Ladies and gentlemen, the Watertown, he'll be back. The Watertown album was produced, as I said, by Bob Gordio. And if you've ever listened to that album, the entire album was a storyline. Uh, Allentown, uh, Elizabeth, as I mentioned, some of the songs. And I just don't understand why it really didn't make it. It was on Warner Brothers at that time. And uh, it's interesting. But this interview that you're seeing right now with Frankie is something that you never knew about the background other than what he was doing as a singer. He was involved in producing records. As a matter of fact, a song which I played by Frankie Nolan called I Still Care. Uh, it was on ABC Paramount. And Frankie does the high parts if you listen to that song. That's and right. audio. You, you back, Frank? <laughs>
Gordio produced other songs other than doing with Bob Crew, other than the Four Seasons. I don't know what happened to Frankie. But Sorry. So, by the way, I also want to take this opportunity while we're pausing here to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a very happy holiday. I know that this Christmas is like no other Christmas. I'll tell you more about that. All right. Sorry we're, about that. We're, we're talking about the string section on Elizabeth for Watertown. Yeah. You talk about yeah, the song. Some of the songs. I mean, Elizabeth, there, there, there's a string line in there that every time I hear it, it raises the hair on my arm. That's one. The other song is Goodbye. If I knew then what I know now. Oh, that, that, that's another song. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. There was no big explosion, no tempest in the sea. And... The train. Yes, at Allentown, the train to Allentown. Right. How did you get Sinatra for good? You know, because Sinatra's, you're talking about guys like Nelson Riddle, Gordon Jenkins. You're talking about Don Costa. You're talking about Jimmy Bowen, who produced things. How did you get Gordio to produce a Sinatra whole album? Well, I had first become friends with, with Frank. Uh, and, and that happened by accident. Uh, his mother was involved in doing a lot of charity work. And she was doing something for some nuns, for, for the blind. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Rosselli was supposed to be the headliner at the show. And they were in a feud over the size of the orchestra. He wanted a bigger orchestra. He said, or he wasn't doing it. Mm -hmm. And Ken Roberts, who was managing me at the time, was very friendly with Frank's mother because Ken was also from Hoboken. Mm -hmm. And he, he said to, uh, to uh, Frank's mom, he said, listen, I got this group. He says, if he gives you a problem, they'll come and they'll do it for nothing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we did it. And Frank found out about it. He sends for me. He tells Julie to call me. Now, I don't, you know, I know him from a distance. I'm just a fan. Yeah. Julie calls me and says, Frank wants to see you. I said, about what? I said, what What I do? Did I just come <laughs> home? Or says, no, no, he wants to see you. Uh, come at this time at, at, at my joint Jilly's and I go and he had already done all his homework he knew everything about what I did and all that he found, went, found out so this is a kid that you know that, that, that carry him big girl don't cry and walk like a man so. he says I know I know I know I know all that he said I want to thank you so much for what you did for my mom he said, come on in the back and said, have some Chinese food with us. At Julie's. That was the beginning of our friendship. Yeah. Now, the friendship, in the course of being friends, we talked about music a lot, you know what I mean? I remember I had a polyp on my, one of my vocal cords, and he sent me to this doctor in New York. Uh -huh. Check it out. And he checked it out. He took care of it. I, I couldn't talk for 10 days and all that. He, he knew everything. He was calling and finding out how I was doing. And when the 10 days was over, I got a call from him. And he says, I'm in Vegas. He said, I want you to come to Vegas. So I... When I was, he says, are you working? I said, no, I said, I'm not working right now. So I went to Vegas. Then they got a suite and this and that and Caesar's Palace. And about four o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call. It says, Mr. Sinatra would like you to come to a suite. So I go up to a suite. I said, man, you want some coffee or some tea? What do you want? Uh, 
He says, everything is okay. I talked to the doctor. He says, and now he says, yeah, you're fine. And he has Bill Miller, his piano player. And he gives me a vocal lesson, some exercises to do. He says, with your range, he says, there should be nobody that can come close to you. And that's how we became friendly. Mm -hmm. So he also appreciated the fact that he knew that I was a big lover of jazz. Mm -hmm. He was very close with Don Costa. I was good friends with, with Don Costa. And I said to him, I wanted to ask him, did you ever think of doing a concept album? This is right after we had done our album. Yep. Uh, Genuine Imitation Life Gazette. Uh, he said, well, what do you mean? I says, an album that tells a story. Every song is attached to the other. Segway, segway in, right. the storyline. Yeah. He says, no, he says, I never did. He said, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, we just did a concept album. Mm -hmm. And we let him hear our concept album. I it says it's a it's a going story. One song is tied to the other, and and the the original story to that album was about a guy who lived upstate New York in a small town. Everybody knew each other was married, had a couple of kids, a uh, regular working guy, brown. And they split, guy. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she, she stepped out on him, and the whole town knew about it. She was so embarrassed, she left, and he didn't know where she went. She left him with the kids, and every now and again, he would write a letter, and he'd Put it in an envelope and seal it, and that's those were all the songs. Yeah, I want to segue real quick into something that the audience never knew, Frank. Uh, you recorded for Motown Records, the yeah. Barrel, right? Uh, Sammy also recorded. Bobby Darren recorded. Okay, even Pat Boone recorded for Motown. Barry could not get a hit with them. You had a song that you recorded. Do you remember the song for Motown? Oh, well, there were several songs. But the that one I, that became the hit. Well, I had some hits with Motown even before the hit that we bought back from Motown. Uh, the first album we did from Motown was called Chameleon. Yep. Okay. I had a hit on that. I had a song called You're Ready Now, which became a number one record in, in the UK. Yeah. Uh, the Night, which became a number one record 20 years later. Right. And, and I think Began was another one. We're all... All Motown. From that. So when we were leaving, when, when Barry Gordy was very excited when he signed us, but he got very involved in the Diana Ross movie, Lady Sings the Blues. And nobody else was paying much attention to what we were doing. We were going in the studio recording, so forth and so on. So we asked him for a release. He said, let me think about it. Let me talk to my staff. And evidently his staff was not into what we were doing, you know what I mean? I did a lot of really I, I a lot of really great stuff for Motown that My Eyes Adored You. Right. Well but we that's the song we bought back. And because that originally was going to be on Motown. Yes. It was on Motown. It was a Motown record. We bought it back. Uh, we asked, could we buy it back? And he wanted a little time to think about it and came to the conclusion that we should have it back. And we did buy it back. Then we brought it to everybody in the business. And it got turned down from everybody in the business. 
except your old friend Larry Utah, right? Who at that time had private stock record, correct? Now the way that all happened was Larry Utah was was leaving the record company that became Arista Records. Right. Clive came in and took over that label. Larry Utah had a lot of hits on that label. Uh, on, on the label that he left. Uh, and let's see. And Larry to, uh, called Bob Crew. He says, I'm coming to LA. Mm -hmm. He says, I have a brand new record company called Private Stock. He said, I want you to play me my first number one record. So he came out. There was a big, big dinner party for him. And Cruz starts playing records for him. And they're there all night and he's playing records for him. And Larry is just going, no, no, that's not it. No, no, no. And Peter Bennett, who was our attorney at the time, yeah. he kept saying to Cruz, he said, why don't you play him the Frankie Valley record from Motown? And and crew is like just not paying that much attention to what he's saying at all. And finally, before the night was over, Larry Utah said, Well, what is this record? Why don't you play me that record? <laughs> so they play the record, and Larry Utah said to crew, That's my first number one record. And, and it was, Tell me about Greece. Well, Greece, I was being managed at the time by Alan Carr, mm -hmm. who was also involved in the movie production of Greece with Robert Sigwood, who mm -hmm. had all records. John Travolta, yeah. Greece, right. Uh, and they were making the movie, and and a few years before that, we had done a concert somewhere in L.A. I forget. It was multiple acts, and the Bee Gees were on it. And Barry and I were talking a bit, and we talked about possibly working together. And the fact that Sigwood and Alan Carr were friends, the Bee Gees were doing a movie called... Uh, uh, it was at uh, Sergeant Beatles song. Uh, I can't. Sergeant Pepper. I can't Jackie, think. Of Jackie gave you it. <laughs> what was it? Sergeant Pepper, Lonely Hearts. Oh, Sergeant Pepper's Lon Lonely <laughs> Hearts Band. <laughs> hey Frank, what would we do without Jackie? <laughs> Listen, I can tell you right now. I don't know what I'd do. Uh, <laughs> and, and, so Barry Gibb, uh, Alan Carr must have said something to Robert Sigwin. And Barry Gibb uh, was the guy that wrote the song Grease. Right, right, right. I got a call and said, Barry wants to know if it's okay if he sends a song over to you. Uh, for you to listen to see if you like it. Uh, he sent it over, it was just guitar and him singing i blew it blew my mind i, I said this is a smash i called don costa up who lived who was living at the time about 10 minutes away from where i was living he come down he listened to he said you gotta do this song he says it's a hit so the rest I, is history the rest is history I, frank jersey boys I was at the premiere in New York with Avalon, Al Pacino was there. Everybody was there. When we walked out- yeah, Zach was there too, if you remember. <laughs> we knew without the reviews that this was a total bam, slam, home run, whatever. It proved to be true. But what happened with the movie? The movie was not as exciting 
as the play. What is your take on that? I don't know because I didn't see the movie. So <laughs> I never went to the premiere. Uh, well, apparently, you know, a lot, a lot of people, I mean, the movie came and it went. Well, that, that's because it, it nev never followed through on what it was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And originally, I went up to Boston and met with Marty Scorsese, and he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or at least that's what he led me to believe, that he, he wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't doubt that he would have done it and done a spectacular job. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere along the way, the writers and, 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 and Bob met with Marty Scorsese and he had a problem with the writers. Uh, so he, he, he just backed away from it totally. Uh, they were questioning him about how he would do the movie and so forth and so on. Yes. Uh, had I known that they were going to go to that meeting, I thought just Bob was going to go. But had I known that they were going to... I never would have. Uh, I, I never would have gone out of my way to make it so that there would be a meeting. How did Clint Eastwood get involved in, in doing the movie? What happened was there were a couple of other people. I, I, I there, there became a, the the guy that was producing the, the movie. Graham King was the producer who also did the Queen movie. Mm -hmm. uh, his money guy fell out. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a combination of a couple of things. Dodgers wanted the movie to come out and felt that even if it wasn't a great movie, it, it, it would... It would promote the Broadway play, which the Dodgers had, right, right. Which they had already seen 10 years. Uh, and Clint Eastwood was, was not a choice that I, I, I would have made. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. It just... It hurt. His background, that, that kind of a movie... He there was not really he didn't have a background. He didn't and have he, a background for the music. No casting yeah. was terrible. Yeah. He did all the music live, which should not have been done that way. Yeah. Uh, and he he made Bob Gordio and I give up our rights because we could have stopped the movie, and he guaranteed us that he wouldn't do anything that we didn't want, and he lied. Yeah, yeah. Basically, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I mean, I, I had several conversations with him on the phone. Uh, he said he wouldn't do anything without letting it come back. And then he reneged. And then Gordio went in and fixed all the music, and he wouldn't use it. Well, that, would, that's the would. answer. That, that's the answer of why the movie, because the play even to, to this is, day. One of the biggest songs ever. Can't take my eyes off you. <laughs> he took that whole middle out and changed it. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't really cast well. It wasn't done well, and it was not supposed to be done like the play. That was the, the thing that was more important than anything to me. It was more of a storyline. The more of a, and he, he missed the whole storyline. I wanted more drama in it, in, in the movie than in the play. And a play and a movie are two different animals totally. And in a play, it, it's a live experience and you're all, everybody's sitting there in their seats and you can allow for things not to be exactly perfect. Right. In a movie, it's through a microscope. 
everything better be perfect. Frank, before we leave, looking back at this wonderful, wonderful career, which is still the top of show business, what, what do you feel, man? I mean, you know, it's got to be so rewarding that you were able to do what you wanted to do and you controlled your career from the very, very beginning. That's got to be something. Well, I learned about controlling your career from being around guys like Otis Blackwell and Charlie Singleton and, and, and all those guys and, and publishers like Al Fine and Goldie Goldmark. I, I knew there was more than having a hit record in order to to build on something so that you had something. Uh, that's how we were able to hold on to our publishing and own our masters. And those were the important things about it. I'm just thrilled that I believed so much in what we were doing that I stayed with that regardless of what anybody else thought about it. That's very important for anybody who is pursuing something that they love. They better get ready to get a lot of turndowns, but those are tests to see how willing you are to really stay in the game. Frankie, I got to tell you, this has been a wonderful hour not for you and me, but for the audience out there that see a different Frankie Valley than you see on stage. This is a guy that came from here and is there because of the love of what he does. And that's the story of life, the passion, the dedication, and the ability when you're down to get up again and start all over again. And Frankie, thank you for just well, you, also, you know, you have to believe in what you're doing and the people you're working with, with any situation that you might be involved with. You know, I, Gordy and I have had a wonderful relationship as partners now for over 50 years. And basically on a handshake, I mean, only as of recent times has anybody talked about, in case either one of us should leave this planet we're on, uh, that it should be spelled out clear for the people we're leaving, whatever we're leaving to, behind, so there, there are no fights or discrepancies or any of that. A man's word is only as important as his word is. You, I've seen you and I, we've lived in certain situations. We've seen many people, but the word is the most important thing. So exactly. Frank, I want to wish you, your lady, the best of the holiday, my man. The macaroni's on its way. The ravioli's on its way. The Monte Guts on its way. <laughs> and for the new year, we'll celebrate by the grace of God. So many of our friends are no longer here, Frank. But by the grace of God, their music, the things that they've done, contributed to what we call show business, will always be remembered. Frankie, thank you. Thank you. And I want to wish you and yours all the best for these holidays. And all those people out there who are listening, happy holidays and good health. My man, Frankie Valley. What more can I tell you? A legend but not only a legend on stage, but as a human being who is no different than you or I, he's a guy that started, look where he is today. And he is an inspiration for young people when he says you're going to have the ups and the downs, but don't ever stop if you truly believe. Keely. Yo, Frank, here's Keely. Love you, Frank. Hey. <laughs> Put your head down so they see how pretty you are. Keep that beard on. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell Pacino not to try and take that. 
<laughs> Thank you, my pal. Thank you. Bye, Jackie. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> so, come on, Jackie. Come over here. Hurry up before we leave. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hey. This, she is, this is Jackie's lady. This is Frankie's lady. She is the lady that makes it all happen. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. Getting love. Merry Christmas. <laughs>